singing. Um, I, I jotted down a few that I used to think the words went like this. Uh, maybe you'll remember these hymns, Bringing in the Sheets. Uh, I used to sing that. thought that was quite novel. Uh, I remember this one, Jesus Gives Me Sweet Peas. Uh, I can't imagine. I know Jesus is loving, but I uh, never could quite figure that one. One of my favorites, Gladly the Cross-Eyed Bear, and I always thought, now, who in the world can approach a grizzly bear and tell if their eyes are crossed or not? And then my all-time favorite, there is a bomb in Gilead. And I thought, I know there's a crisis in the Holy Land, but uh, I didn't know we were supposed to sing about it uh, there in our hymn book. I, I sang the songs, but I did not know the words. I did not understand them. And like that... Uh, uh, that's cute, uh, but like that, I think there are uh, many in the church that come to church and they wonder, why do we do what we do? And why do we do it the way that we do it? Uh, there's a lot of questions that people have, and there are a lot of questions that people have given me over the years. Let me just read a few of these to you. What is the church? What is the role of men in the church and why? What is the role of women in the church and why? What is calling? What is the difference between a bishop, an overseer, an elder, a shepherd, a pastor, a servant, a minister, or is there any difference at all? Uh, what is the nature of Scripture? What is its role in the life of the church? What is its role in my life? What are the offices of the church, and can just anybody fill those offices? What classifies as strange or false doctrine? What classifies as sound teaching? How do the older and the younger men relate to one another in the church? How do the older ladies and younger women relate to one another in the church? How does the church take care of widows? How does the church take care of their pastor? Who is God and what is he like? How is Jesus our mediator? Did Jesus die for everyone? Why share your faith and why is a personal testimony important? What is the law for? God has entrusted you and I with something. What is it? If he's entrusted us with something, we need to know what it is. What does it mean to deliver someone over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh? What is the content of prayer? What about discipleship? What is spiritual warfare? What about your work? What about your cantankerous boss? What about, or what does a Christian flee, and what does a Christian follow? What brings God's approval in my life? What are the last days and what do they look like? What is the role of persecution and suffering in yours and mine's life? What will it be like to stand before God and be judged? Why are we to be zealous of good works? Well, all of those questions that I have asked, and maybe you were asking some of those, all of those are found in where we're going to be over the next several months, and that is in the pastoral epistles. And so, uh, I, I think the, the greatest challenge that a believer has may quite possibly be 
giving their life to building the church. It doesn't mean everybody has to be a pastor. It doesn't mean everybody has to teach. Uh, but it does mean that God's people are responsible. Uh, we've entitled this the pillars of truth because the pastoral epistles are those. Uh, they describe the church as the pillar and the ground of truth. So let me help you out here. Uh, all of uh, the pastoral epistles are found in a group in your Bible. If you'll think about it this way. In the New Testament, there are five books that are grouped together. They all start with the word T or the letter T. They are 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Those last three, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are in fact the pastoral epistles. Uh, ben read for us. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 1 and 2. And you can go ahead and turn in your Bible there. And you know, uh, just find a T in the New Testament and you'll eventually get there. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. So since this is where we're going to be for the next several months, uh, I have to do something that I don't normally do. And that's to uh, do a little background uh, for these three books. And so we're going to do some background. I'm going to preach a sermon. And uh, my sermon has one point, and then in that, uh, middle of all that, we're going to uh, cast our vision for this year. And it's all going to be based out of the pastoral epistles. So, uh, we're talking about 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So, 1 Timothy was written about 64 A.D. Titus was written about 65 or 66 A.D. 2 Timothy was written about 67 A.D. They are not in chronological order. Uh, they were not written this way. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. If they go in chronology, it is 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy. That's the order of the books. Uh, 1 Timothy uh, consists of six chapters. It is a manual for church life. You want to see what a church is supposed to look like? Uh, that's what we'll find out in 1 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy consists of four chapters, and it is a farewell address uh, that Paul is giving. Uh, he is about to have his life snuffed out, and he does so at the end of 2 Timothy. Titus is a blueprint for the church, and it consists of three chapters. 1 Timothy and Titus are pastoral in uh, content. 2 Timothy is more personal than it is pastoral. Now, I said uh, one of the questions that was asked is that God has entrusted us with something. It's always good to know what you've been entrusted with, right? If God has entrusted us with something, how are we going to keep it if we don't know what it is? So, uh, each one of those books has an emphasis on the gospel. And in 1 Timothy, um, we are told to protect the gospel. 1 Timothy 6, 20. Guard what has been entrusted to you. So that's what's been entrusted to you. The gospel. And we are to protect it. Guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoiding irre irreverent and empty speech. And contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge. So in 1 Timothy we're going to find out how to protect the gospel. In 2 Timothy we are told to preach the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. Preach the word. He didn't say preach from the word. He didn't say preach about the word. He said preach the word. Uh, be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. So in 1 Timothy, we're told to protect the gospel. In 2 Timothy, we're told to preach the gospel. And in the book of Titus, we're told to practice the gospel. We've all been told at one time or another, practice what you preach. Well, that's just logical sequence of these books. Uh, Titus 3.8. This saying is trustworthy. I want to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. The theme of 1 Timothy is this. Fight the good fight of faith. 2 Timothy, simply be faithful. Titus is maintain good works. The key to 1 Timothy, I, I know I'm going fast. I know I'm, time out. I know I'm going fast. And I know I probably should have gave you a uh, 
sheet. You can go to the website. On the front page, there's a place where it says my notes. You punch that and you can see my sermon notes and get all of this. So, anyway. Uh, the key to uh, 2 Timothy is... Uh, uh, the gospel and faithfulness to it. And then the key to Titus is godliness and service. You'll find phrases over and over again through these books. Uh, one of them is this saying is trustworthy. Or this is a saying worthy of full acceptance. Uh, and then Paul talks about we know that. And we've got to define what that is. And he talks about these things. And he, over and over again he tells Timothy and Titus about the world or these guys that aren't being what they should be. And then he turns the corner and he says, but as for you. And so we're going to see that phrase over and over again. Timothy is unique in that <clears throat> Paul is a Jewish apostle. Timothy is his son in the faith, which we'll see in just a second. Interestingly enough, Timothy's mother was Jewish. His father was a Greek. He was not fully Jewish. Titus, on the other hand, was not Jewish at all. He was totally a Greek, totally Gentile. Timothy was sent by Paul to Ephesus after Paul had been there for three years to pastor the first Baptist church of Ephesus. Sprawling uh, metropolis, uh, a place of rampant immorality. It was the epicenter of the worship of the goddess Diana. So it was a place of just all sorts of moral filth that Timothy had to pasture in the middle of. Titus, on the other hand, was told to pastor on the island of Crete. Uh, whereas Timothy was pastoring in the Metroplex, uh, Titus was pastoring in Bowie. Uh, that's the difference between these two fellows. It just so happens that I've spent a lot of time in these three books for obvious reasons. One of my, or my favorite Bible verse is found in 2 Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of peer, fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That is my life verse. Now, why would God send three letters to two men? Think about it. Most of the letters in your Bible, if you have the same kind of Bible I do, most of the letters in your Bible, that was a joke, most of the letters in your Bible are written to churches. They're not written to individuals. Uh, these are some of the exceptions. Why would God send three letters to two men? Uh, so here's why. To teach them the truth about his church. And so I believe I've provided for you a definition of the church. It is a global community of Christ followers inaugurated by the Holy Spirit who believe in the deity, the vicarious death, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and are commissioned to proclaim the, the good news of his salvation to the world. It is le a church is less about a place and more about a gathered people in a place. When we say things like this, I know, I know what we mean when we say this. But when we say things like this, I'm going to go up to the church. That may be geographically correct, but that is theologically incorrect. The church is not a place. The church is a people that meets in a place. Because you are the church. The church is not a thing. The Bible refers to the church as a her. She is the bride of Christ. So it's more proper to think about the church in terms of a gathered people. And not a specific location per se. But a particular group of people. 
a global community. We are more, the body of Christ is more than Southside Baptist Church. We are a global community of Christ followers. It came into being at Pentecost, inaugurated by the Holy Spirit. It is made up of people who believe in the deity of Christ, his vicarious death, and his bodily resurrection. And we are commissioned simply to proclaim the good news of his salvation to the world. I could add there, make disciples. 1 Timothy 3.15 describes us this way. We are the church of the living God. The pillar and the ground of truth. That is us. Paul provided Timothy and Titus foundational truth to build his church. There's a lot of gadgets and gadgets and all sorts of things out there that you can go to the bookstore and buy. And, you know, this will turn your church around in 15 weeks and all of that kind of stuff. All I know is the church in the book of Acts had no novel gadgets. They didn't have a lot of programs. As a matter of fact, you know what their program was? Them. That was their program. The church and the spirit who was working th through them. But God gave the church everything uh, here that we see in the pastoral epistles. And above all things, truth is utmost. It is unchanging. Our world is changing right before our eyes. Truth does not change. God does not change. Truth is utmost. It is unchanging. It determines how we think and how we act. If we get our truth right, then we will act right and we will think right. If we get our truth wrong, we will act wrong and we will think wrong. So it is incumbent upon us to do what? Get our truth right. Right? Yes. So your journey <coughs> into truth has a single starting point. Uh, I don't think in over 40 years of doing this, I've ever done this. The sermon has one point. Here it is. You must have confidence in your salvation. <coughs> Before we ever can figure out how to do church, why we do certain things in church, we got to figure out that first initial thing. Barb spoke about it earlier. She gave a date and a time. I'll give you a date and a time as well. Second week of November, 1973, Kinshire Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, on a Sunday night, I came forward and gave my life to Christ. I remember the time, I remember the date, I remember the moment. You say, well, I, Brother Tony, I, don't, I can't remember the, the date and I don't remember the time. But you should be able to remember the event. You should, hey, as you have heard me state before, if church is over and I walk out here to the road and do not look and an 18 wheeler is coming down the road, you know what's going to happen? I will be forever changed. When somebody meets God in a head-on collision, they are forever changed and they will remember it. Because he is God. Right? So, you must have confidence in your salvation. I heard somebody demeaning this this week on the radio. <laughs> about the whole, you know that you know that you know. You should be that confident. You should not walk around with question marks about your eternal destiny. You should nail that down. You should nail that down today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Not some more convenient day. Not some time down the road. Now is the time because the breath you are getting now is the only one that you're guaranteed of. So you need to hammer that out. See, there's a difference between security and assurance. Security is what you have in Christ. I am secure in Christ. I have been secure in Christ since November of 1973. 
There is nothing that can take me out of his hand. I am secure. He is the one who is able to keep me from falling. Jude chapter, or Jude verse 24. I am secure in him. Now, security is not assurance. Security is what I have. Assurance is what you feel. Sometimes there have been times, <laughs> maybe where I have not been what I have ought to be and be. Uh, maybe I was touched by a sermon in such a way that it made me think. And I questioned my assurance. It made me start thinking about it. Assurance is what you feel. That, that, that may come and go depending on where you're at with the Lord. Security never changes. If you're saved, you will always be saved. That doesn't mean that you're always going to be assured. Because the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. And sometimes we can misunderstand that as a calling to salvation when it's really a calling to repentance as his child. But we, before we can ever figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, before we can ever figure out what to do in church, what our part is, what our role is, we're going to nail down the first thing, the initial thing. You must have confidence in your salvation. Let's look there in those first two verses. It simply gives us the author of this book and the recipient of the book. The author is in verse 1. The recipient is in verse 2. Paul, an apostle. Apostolos or apostolon, either one. Just means one that is sent. One that is sent. But it's more than that here. Because Paul is an apostle. I know that there are certain denominations. And I know that there are certain TV preachers that get on and say, I'm an apostle. And all I'm going to say is, no you're not. There are, <clears throat> read my lips, as George Bush used to say, there are no more apostles. The qualification for an apostle was that he had to be an eyewitness of Jesus. He had to be actually somebody that saw Jesus with his own eyes. There are no apostles. They were a unique group of men who God called to not only write Scripture, but to verify Scripture. And they are the foundation, or they are part of the foundation of the church, the pillar and ground of truth. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Let's not skip over that. Christ. Christ is a title. Christ is a title. It means anointed one. The Old Testament equivalent would be Messiah. The, uh, the, the, the modern day vernacular of that uh, would be simply king. Now I like reading it that way. Paul, an apostle of King Jesus. Now Jesus, uh, when he was born, they said name him this because he's going to save uh, his people from their sins. It means God is salvation. It's the equivalent of Joshua from the Old Testament. Yeshua. God is my salvation. Paul, an apostle of King Jesus, who is the God of my salvation. You see, the God of your salvation? Do you have salvation? He says it's by the command of of God our Savior. So he's not just speaking for himself. He's speaking for a collective of people. Uh, he's, he's our Savior. Now I know for a fact this morning that he's my Savior. And I'm wishing above all else 
that he's all of ours Savior, right? Like Paul can say there. By the command of God, our Savior, that's unique. In the Old Testament, God, ha God is looked upon as Savior. But in the New Testament, it is usually Jesus Christ who is typified as the Savior. But yet, here you see him refer to him as God our Savior. And of Christ Jesus, King Jesus, our hope. We sang about that earlier. Jesus Christ, my living hope. What is that? It's not, it's not this. You know, it's been 105 every day this week on the average. And I'm just hoping that it rains. That's not that. That's not that. When we say that, what we're saying is, I don't know if it is, I'm not sure. It looks like it, but then it passes by. Well, that's not hope. That's not biblical hope. A biblical hope is a confident expectation. It's a confident expectation. And it, it describes Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, as our hope, our confident expectation. He is our confident expectation in life. He is our confident expectation in death. He is our confident expectation in the valley. He's our confident expectation on the mountaintop. He is our confident expectation at home. He is our confident expectation at work. On the athletic field. In the classroom. In the voting booth. All of those places, Jesus is our confident expectation. So that's who wrote this book. He's quite confident in his salvation. So much so that he can express this to Timothy. Verse 2. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. That's a definite article. It's not a faith, not indefinite article. It's a definite article. That means it's speaking of a particular faith, a, a, uh, a body of belief that one holds to. And Paul says, this guy, Timothy, he's my true son in the faith because he holds to the same beliefs that I hold to. He goes on to describe uh, this guy, Timothy, and some of the things that he's experienced. And he says, grace, mercy, and peace from uh, God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Timothy is a true son in faith because he is the recipient of grace. That is God's unmerited favor. That is God doing to me and for me what I do not deserve. He's also the recipient of mercy. That is God's compassion and his kindness towards me. That is God do, uh, not doing to me what I do deserve. So if you want to figure out what the difference is between grace and mercy, it's this. Let me, let me illustrate it. Grace is heaven. I don't deserve that. He's giving me that. He's letting me go there. That's grace. Mercy is God not letting me go to hell. I do deserve that. That's what I should get, but instead he gives me what I don't deserve. We sang about that earlier. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's really amazing because he knew what terrible wretches we would be after he saved us and he went ahead and saved us anyway. And he concludes that by saying he's also the recipient of peace. I don't even know if I can define peace in the Bible. I know the definition, 
But I don't know that I can express it the way that the Bible intends for it to be expressed. It means to be whole. It means to be sound. It means to have cessation of hostilities ceased between me and God. He's not, I am no longer his enemy. Now I am his friend. But just to talk about wholeness and soundness, uh, you know, it truly is the peace that passes all understanding that he gives us. And he says it's from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me just sum up verses 1 and 2 there. He has saved us from sin's penalty, sin's power, and one day he's going to save us from sin's presence. He saves us to himself, and he saves us for himself. I, I think sometimes we forget that part in calling people to Christ. Jesus is not only saving us from ourselves, he is saving us to himself, and he is saving us for himself. That means we are his servants. Better yet, we are his doulos. We are his slaves. And what else have we seen? Jesus is the only hope for Paul. He's the only hope for Timothy. He's the only hope for Tony. And he's the only hope for you. This passage tells me, just two verses, we have a mission. We have a savior. We have a Lord. We have a hope. We have a family. We have something to believe. We have grace. We have mercy. We have peace. We have a father. And we have a king. You have a father who will never let you go. And you have a savior and a king who will never let you down. You must have confidence in your salvation. Do you? That's the question. Do you? Say, so, well, Brother Tony, I, I came forward in church one day. That's not what I asked. I've done that before and it didn't mean a thing. Well, I, ma I made a profession of faith. Let me just describe that the way my old pastor used to describe that. If you're trusting in a profession of faith, that is like... Leaning on a shadow. That's not very sound. Walking aisles. Shedding tears. Professions of faith do not save. A person saves. Jesus saves. As the days pass. More and more. I believe this is true. This is my opinion, but I, I, I think it's true. There will be an increased separation between those that profess Christ and those that possess Christ. Because brothers and sisters, it's just going to get harder to serve the Lord and to be a Christian in this world. And there will become, there'll, there'll come a division. And people will just fall by the wayside. The, the wheat will be separated from the tares. Because it's not going to get any easier. It's just going to get worse and worse. So because of that, <clears throat> as we're thinking about our church year and what we should do and what we should be, again, no, no nifty gadgets and I'm not going to pull a rabbit out of my hat. Uh... We're going to live out 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And I, I, I want to uh, think about these in four different ways. And the first one is a, a visible witness. A visible witness. All these have to do with our witness. So where is that in, first, or where is that in the pastorals? It's in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, 
prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life and in all godliness and dignity. A visible witness. Well, how are we going to do that, Brother Tony? Here's how we're going to do that. Before our worship services begin, we are going to pray. It's not anything official. When you come in from Sunday school, just come up here and start praying. And when it's time for church to start, Barb will start church. Don't feel uncomfortable about it. I'm not going to call you to do it. But I think... <laughs> you remember the scene in... Uh, Raiders of, not Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, when they're searching for the Holy Grail, that one, whatever it's called. And the Nazi asked Sean Connery, it's time to ask yourself what you believe. I think it's time to ask ourselves, all of us, what we believe. It's one thing to say, I believe in prayer, it's another thing to pray. We'll have a countdown timer over there. And as I said, you can come and go as you please. And if, if you're still praying while we're starting, that's fine. And if you want to mingle, that's fine too. But I think we need to be praying. And I think we need to be known as a church that prays. You say, well, I can pray in my pew. Yes, you can. But it is powerful to have a visible witness. When other people see other people pray, you know what it does? It inspires other people to pray. There are some things in the Bible that are taught, but there are some things in the Bible that are taught and caught. And when we observe God working in other people, it inspires us to ask God to do something in me or ask, why aren't you doing something in me? So we're going to start that next week. A visible witness of prayer. Second, a purposeful witness. 2 Timothy 1.8 So don't be ashamed of the testimony about your Lord or our Lord relying on the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.8 Purposeful witness. See, we can have a visitation program. That's fine. Not opposed to that. But the book, the church in the book of Acts had no program. They was the program. Everywhere they went, they were the church. How often do you see people? Every day. If you happen to go visit them at their home, they may be there and they may not be there. But you're in constant contact with people all day. Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Say, well, I don't know what to say. If you know enough to get saved, you know enough to lead somebody to be saved. If you can't lead somebody to be saved, you may need to look in the mirror and ask oneself, am I saved? There's scripture to use for sure. But there is power in a personal testimony. Barb just gave one 20 minutes ago. I was lost and then Jesus found me in my dorm room. That's a testimony. There. That's all you got to know. Then a familial witness. Third... 1 Timothy 3.15 describes this as the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. A church is not brick and mortar. Pews and carpet, wood, bills, air condition. That's not a church. The church is a living thing. It's an entity. It's a family. <laughs> All of these things are intentional. We have to be intentional about them. They will not just happen 
for, for happenstance. They're not just going to occur. We have to intentionally pray. We have to intentionally witness wherever we're at. If you don't know what to say, take one of these and drop it off wherever you're at. Just make sure you sign your name on the back of it and put the church's name. You have to be intentional about everything you do. We want to be a family, do we not? We have to act like a family. What do families do together? They fellowship together. They eat together. They go out together. They play together. They do things together. That's what families do. We have to be intentional. That will not happen. And then the last one, a scriptural witness. So a visible witness, prayer, a purposeful witness, our testimony or witness, witnessing, a familial witness, just be the body of Christ, uh, and a scriptural riff, r witness. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly dividing the word of truth. When you come to church, bring your Bible. When you come to church, we're going to work in the Word. It's your workbook. Bring it. Say, well, I, I just don't get nothing out of what you preach. You would be surprised if you take notes. When it, whenever I have a prof that, I, that I've had over the years and not getting nothing out of him, if I take notes, I, all of a sudden I find out this guy's a wealth of wisdom. I'm not saying that I am. But even a blind hog can find an acorn every now and then. Scriptural witness. We need to be a people of the book. We need to have our Bibles open. This sounds silly. But I'll just show you the way I was raised. Our pastor. He was always full of practical wisdom. He would tell us stuff like this. When you're standing for the invitation, don't close your Bible. Leave your Bible open in the pew because there's somebody standing behind you. If you've got a large print edition, they might can read the words of your page. Because God's not through until he's through. A scriptural witness. All of these things have to be intentional. They just have to be. They're not going to happen by chance. Lightning is not going to strike us and it occur. We have to do our part. So, can you go to an event where you met the Lord? I can tell you the time. I can tell you the place. Where the Lord saved me by his wonderful grace. I can't tell you how. I don't know why. I just know that he did it. As the days pass more and more. Without Christ. Lost person. Eventually. Eventually. Sin and death will overtake you. But as long as we have a moment like this, you can respond. You can walk an aisle. That's fine. Some people think that's the only way by having an invitation. I give a gospel invitation every time I get up to preach. I may not have an altar call, but I'm giving a gospel invitation just like I'm doing now. You can walk this aisle, take my hand, and ask me for help. You know what else you can do? You can meet me at the back door and ask me for help. You know what else you can do? You can call me on the phone and ask me for help. You know what else you can do? You can ask anybody to sit to your right or to your left or in front or in back of you, could you help me please? And I assure you, there's somebody within this body 
that will either help you or will get you to somebody that can God's invitation is always open until He closes it. Until He closes it. And by the way, it's open right now. Open right now.